Thanks very much for showing up so very gracefully at this early hour. And uh, my talk is called Expressionism and Fluid Expressionism as an ontology for theatre. And uh, what um, I would like to show here is an expressionist ontology for post traumatic theatre. And here I would like to point out how um, drama studies could actually serve as an ontology of emergence. So the paper proposes an expressionist ontology and an adjacent theory of mimesis for post traumatic theatre in approaching the realities of contemporary drama from the vantage point not of representation but of sense. And uh, in this way this paper scaffolds um, new poetics for dramatic criticism which is non-purposive, non-actional and one that captures the passage between potentiality and actuality, continuity and completion. This type of dramatic criticism does not rely on formal qualification but seeks the significance of drama in its ontological grounding. So, an expressionist mimesis seeks to trace an ontological portrait of drama by recomposing its very ontology. So, what are the stakes within this shift, one would like to ask? And um, this um, um, could be answered with um, the presupposition that in this way Aristotelian becoming would uh, be retained, but Entelechy would be displaced with, with and um, would be displaced. And, this processual but non purposive scenario would also perhaps replace the Aristotelian model of action. Here, mimesis no longer relies on the category of action, but becomes a procedure of emergence. And instead of gesturing toward a reality external to the literary world in drama, mimesis begins to address matters of sense. And here is how I'm going to proceed. Um, I am going to quickly sketch out the dramatic theory in the poetics and how this differs from post-symmetric theatre, theater, then I am going to move forward to the imminent mimesis and what I understand with this term, uh, which is probably going to be nothing new to the losers, I guess, and then um, I'm going to show my so-called ontological scaffold, how expression um, becomes um, simultaneously a matter of mimesis and a matter of sense or a matter of event of sense. And um, in the final gesture, I will show how these um, various musings perhaps uh, may become additive to um, the very making of worlds in drama. So um, what we have with Aristotle and his poetics is the very fact that we do have a very strong emphasis on action and um, uh, an intellectual notion of plot. At the same time, um, we have cause-effect relationships, so there is this strong, strong logicality of the plot and uh, also causal arrangement um, by dint of notions of um, potentiality and actuality, which um, within the dramatic plot uh, is being translated into matters of probability and necessity. So we also have a very strong emphasis on character and also the entire idea that human um, entities are um, the ones that propel the plot by virtue of their knowing and unknowing, their just and inept action and so on. So uh, this, um, there is this um, purposive human consciousness that uh, becomes the very source of action. Mm -hmm. And uh, one may also be able to envision a type of drama that uh, puts a very much stronger emphasis on events on a becoming which is non-purposive and um, a causality that is not so much Aristotelian but one that perhaps pertains to matters of synchronicity even and uh, in this way we may actually also have a movement of um, expression uh, in the delusion sense but also perhaps in the Neoplatonic sense um, only that uh, speaking with Eugene Thacker perhaps one um, would be able to speak about um, a radical Neoplatonism without center, so that we have an entity, the Neoplatonic one O would be a fluent, ecstatic, flowing forth and fundamentally generous, but at the same time not um, attached to a certain source of, uh, or um, um, a certain grounding. So um, what's interesting here is um, that once we adopt the notions of virtuality and actuality with Deleuze, then um, Aristotelian probability and necessity would begin to look very differently um, because um, whereas with Aristotle we have uh, um, 
potentiality and actuality being the unreal and the real, uh, with uh, Deleuze virtuality and actuality are both um, real, so to speak. Um, so in, um, this, um, in these dialogues with Clay Brunet, there is this moment in which he says that um, each actual entity is enclosed by a cloud of virtualities and that um, the virtuality somehow infuses in itself, infuses itself into a certain being um, and is equally important and equally valid for um, its constitution um, and just as um, any actual entity would be. And in this way we would have um, various aggregates of responsive utilities and not necessarily a singular source of action. Mm -hmm. And also what would be primary here, it would be not be the, the, the actual model with its um, human constituents, but perhaps a surface of sense would become primary or um, the very emergence of that moment of sense. And, um, and what post-dramatic theater has um, to do with this, it, well, basically I would say that post-dramatic theater presents us with an ontology that is very much attuned to um, this style of theater. So um, if we are to speak with the Husky Simon and his over post-dramatic theater, he also um, actually says that um, the distinguishing condition of post-dramatic theater is this irreducible event structure. Um, then we do not have notions of action, causality, and character anymore. We don't have um, any spatial temporal determinations. Mm, dialogue is not necessarily there. And at the same time, well, well, this very radical statement he says that post traumatic theater is actually theater without drama, in which he means um, that it is a theater without um, any textual given or the textual given is actually not necessarily there. And also, at certain moments, he likens this to a theater of intensity and also a theater of potentiality, which is very interesting and somehow very delusive in spirit as well. So um, I would like to point to some examples, and those would be um, very paradigmatic ones, perhaps such as Sarkin's class for formulaic psychosis, but also perhaps characters just far away or the striker. And um, what they present us with are not so much worlds which are incredibly strange and uh, incredibly unfamiliar and um, somehow almost grotesque in their insistence of, of what is violent and what is aberrant and what is not quite right, but also perhaps their problematic ontology. Well, for instance, um, we have uh, Sarah in her class and um, where we have two siblings that are um, subjected to various um, mutilation scenes and then we have Sarah Kane's um, Crave um, where we also have a very different um, vision of drama which is um, almost uh, some sort of narrative in which we have four characters completely nondescript but at the same time gaining certain um, personality in the course of the performance and um, well, basically sitting in their chairs and narrating a certain, certain scenarios of longing and uh, here this is one shot, screenshot from uh, uh, Carol Churchy went far away where we have an almost uh, an object-oriented philosophy scenario where we have a universal war with uh, various um, some sort of an ecological spectacle of total catastrophe, an universal war of, war of all against all, and uh, here what we have are various forces of nature, objects and, and humans put on the same plane and basically struggling um, for survival perhaps, or actually struggling to find the right side to fight on. And then we also have um, heritage in this cycle, this is this um, mythical shape-shifting creature coming from certain undergrounds into um, erupting um, uh, somehow into the human world, into the human universe and uh, bringing havoc, but also um, this um, could be said to be an ecological drama of sorts as well because um, this creature also shows itself to be fundamentally confused and fundamentally baffled by the world of humans. Um, so there is also a very um, interesting comical side to it, almost. So, um, this place, um, I would say, maybe also we need a new ontological scaffold. 
And what I have um, used here is the discussions on philosophy and the logic of science. And my, my suggestion would be um, instead of um, working with epistemological descriptions or, or with um, any descriptive matter whatsoever, one may actually want to turn to um, matters of ontology and um, tra trace various ways in which expression um, actually congeals into sense or matters of how um, the expression becomes expressed or the expressible becomes be expressed, so to speak. And um, what um, I would suggest is that um, um, in this way an imminent and dynamic no notion of mimesis takes shape and uh, this is also a notion of mimesis that foregrounds the event structure of this place. So um, what becomes primary here is not so much um, any sort of givenness but perhaps the very um, gesture of, of generating the literary world and this very gesture of, of of motioning from potentiality toward actuality, whereas this type of actuality is actually um, never arrived at. So um, we uh, are confronted with um, some sort of continual movement in which continual ways of novelty are being generated. So um, I would perhaps skip this because uh, this is perhaps uh, extremely obsolete and uh, very much familiar to the Wilsons. Just very sketchily, um, well, uh, perhaps just very sketchily mention. Um, so, um, what I uh, understand under if this type of imminent mimesis would be a generative procedure that basically enacts mimesis, um, whereas, uh, whereby actually mimesis serves as a constitutive principle of sorts, and uh, expression is its um, active site, so to speak. And um, what this um, notion, um, what this notion of expression does, is um, that it um, facilitates a certain communication between orders. Um, just as um, in Greek mythology, there is this um, figure of the psychopomp, the messenger between worlds, and uh, I would say that expression, which is perhaps a very hermetic thing, uh, expression has this transmissive stat status of um, facilitating this type of communication. And at the same, wh whereas um, expression is motion defined and uh, serves as a functional imminent substratum um, beneath the, the, the order of things, well, basically, this kind of thing that um, works with uh, those forces and potencies that underlie the given. Um, at the same time, it is non purposive in character. And, uh, well, something that is perhaps not entirely counterintuitive, well, I would probably. Um, would like to um, posit is as um, fundamentally plastic or there is this elasticity of the relation and its capacity to gesture towards two disparate realms whereas not um, mm, this um, gesturing does not really amount to any interfusion between the disparates at the same time. So mm, there is also this moment of interdependence and um, it is precisely in this motion of expression, I would say, that uh, the emergence of forms takes place. So, the transformative force of expression um, shows itself in the moment in which um, there is a certain brink of emergence being reached and um, there is a certain moment in which an event of sense transpires between those um, um, moments of interaction. Um, and this is the modem um, that I would like to um, put forward. And um, so I would have to warn you that it's perhaps a little bit funny to look at because um, it would <laughs> most probably be very reductive. So there is this motion of expression, and these are the series of words and the series of worlds, um, as I have called them. Well, by series of worlds, I mean those matters of. Um, of language or the conceptual existence of things and worlds are the aggregates of states of affairs and things enmeshed in their materiality and uh, what takes place here um, by the end of the work of expression is basically this um, not necessarily interfusion and not necessarily communication but this kind of a productive alliance or a productive alignment between the two and uh, there is this um, there in the middle there is this moment of um, <laughs> 
or there is this moment of maximum proximity, and I would say that in this moment of maximum proximity between the series, um, somehow uh, this moment of, of this event of sense would be said to transpire. So um, there is this transformation to express sense, or there is this surface of sense, so to speak. And, um, and there is this continuum motion of evolvement and involvement, of, or convergence and divergence. So, um, so it, one could see that expression here s serves as a non-motivated, self-propelled motion. It takes place in the vacuity between the series and um, of worlds and their respondent series of words existing only within the tensions between them. It works in two directions simultaneously, which is also an appropriation from Deleuze, and uh, causing aggregates of worlds and words to interact without intersecting. This interaction takes place in the very activity of transmission. Here mimesis does not amount to any of the discrete regions at hand, nor does it align with the relation whose elasticity allows for interaction between words and worlds. Rather, Mimesis encompasses the entire constellation of disparate regions, their empty middle and the transmission that expression carries forward. Mimesis and expression, then, are two sides of the same thing. Mimesis is the procedural principle of expression, and expression is the enaction of mimesis. And uh, um, so, basically, what happens once this uh, moment of uh, expression has transpired, and once an event of sense has taken place, so to speak, is also, quite unfortunately, so the order of representation that uh, takes shape or that be becomes consolidated um, within this motion. And um, my suggestion would be that uh, the order of representation takes place in two modes, namely an immanent and a transcendent one. And I have um, sketched out what um, this um, is supposed to mean, so the order of transcendence would be a vertical one, um, so we would have the two-world ontology um, vertically, so there is more to what meets the eye, and um, we have the constitution of a foreground and a background, so to speak, so there is uh, always something um, that remains hidden from view, or there is uh, this fundamental moment of a secret, so to speak, and also in this way we do have the consolidation of regions of presence and regions of absence and uh, those various ontologies that go with that. Mm. So it is here that we also speak of representation per se, whereas uh, within the order of imminence we may actually begin to speak of some sort of quasi-representation. And uh, in, it, it is also in this order that um, we would have to Encounter, encounter a certain voice on high or a certain normative presence or a certain mm, commanding entity, so to speak. Mm, whereas within an order of limits, we will have a flat ontology, perpetual foreground, visibility, full explication, and so on and so forth, about the entire range of Deleuzean um, qualifications. And this would be also um, a, bi a bi directional and uh, horizontal order, so to speak. Mm. And um, as Zulu says, this is a single voice for every hundred voices. And uh, mm, to conclude, two minutes. Thanks very much. So, I'm <coughs> very much in time almost. Um, so, um, this is the diagram that I have um, produced. And um, here we see how mimesis is a constitutive principle, and there is the generative procedure of expression, and there is the movement that um, I hope you will love now. <laughs> move and, and and there is the order of representation being reached the moment that uh, this uh, um, this movement of expression reaches a surface of sense, um, which is fundamentally mm, quite interesting because sense is this supra representational component and it is something that has to do with an extra being and something which is fundamentally very much liberating and non representational. But with the very emergence of sense, uh, my suggestion would be. In, well, unfortunately, it happens so that with the very emergence of sense, um, the order of representation takes shape as well. And um, these are the two modes in which um, representation congeals, and those I have called mimesis and event, um, very much sketchy. So, so, so the second order of mimesis has to do with the region of representation. And um, 
um, what um, is so nominally called event would be this region of sense, or what Lewis calls the event of sense. Mm. So whereas the one would be one of division, transcendence, substance, and presence, the other one would have to do with university, imminence, and regions of non-differentiation. And uh, my other suggestion would be that, uh, of course, uh, one cannot really encounter any of these independently, so there is also a certain porousness between the two of them and a certain um, interference so that um, they are somehow always connected to one another and somehow always dependent on, on one another. There is this codependence that almost has to do with the chain of space um, in which, well, um, once we turn our, uh, once we close our left eye, we have representations. But once we, uh, uh, we um, close the right one, we would have um, the or an order of expression and event of sense and so on and so forth. So it is perhaps also some sort of a, um, continual switching back and forth between perspectives that uh, may be productive in itself too. So thank you very much. These are um, very important and pertinent questions, so um, I'm very glad that I, re the, um, I have been asking. Well, yes, uh, the notion of becoming in Deleuze is actually very similar to, um, to what um, I do, and basically this is also a project that has to do with a certain redeeming of mimesis, so to speak. So a certain refiguration of mimesis that um, it also um, aims to show that mimesis is uh, not this... Um, perhaps normative and um, and almost uh, oh sorry so that means it's not this normative um, and almost hostile order but perhaps something which is um, in itself productive and something which um, carries a certain positive potential as well and uh, this is why I have decided to um, locate mimesis not necessarily in this formative motion of expression, um, whereas this, well, but, but in the entire constitutory structure of uh, having a motion of expression, emergence of event of sense, and then also um, perhaps um, a moment of a consolidation of representational regions. So, um, what's, what would be interesting here in terms of post-traumatic theatre is that post-traumatic theatre would not be located on the order, of, uh, on the level of the already consolidated representation regions, but we would have it somewhere in between, exactly in this moment of actually becoming, exactly in this moment of collision between expression and sense, so to speak. And um, so to answer the question about becoming, um, I would perhaps say that. Um, what um, might be aligned with the words in becoming here would be um, the motion of expression and its motion towards sense. But um, in uh, my framework, um, actually, um, I would not work with the words in becoming, but I would work with a, a, a more holistic notion of images, which basically encom encompasses this entire region, this entire constel constellation of of various characteristics, so that we would not have one discrete definition, but people have a constellation of definitions that are somehow interconnected with one another and also informing each other simultaneously, so to speak. Mm, and um, the second question, so the notion of mimesis, um, imminent mimesis, mm, and how this um, works in terms of performativity, mm, 
I have been thinking about this as well, and um, I still haven't decided yet. I, I, don't, I still don't really quite have a satisfactory answer as to how to look at performativity. Somehow, I have the feeling that performativity um, is also, in a way, quite similar. And for instance, there is this book by Erika fischer Richter, The Transformative Power of Performance. And there she also defines performance in terms of emergence, in terms of neurodiscipline event structure, and so on and so forth. And this is extremely interesting and very illuminating. But I have the feeling that what is missing there is this ontological understanding. Because I do have the feeling that what is presented in terms of performativity is um, an epistemological and more or less descriptive or classificatory notion of, uh, of, of performativity. And I, well, my project has to do with perhaps an ontological inquiry into these regions. So, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.